If you are currently on social media and you have a Facebook or Instagram account, please go and follow the Crossover Instagram page and like the Facebook page. When you do that, you will get notifications anytime Crossover goes live with video. Be sure to check the Crossover page regularly to share the Crossover videos and graphics with your friends and family. Remember, we are not looking for likes, we are aiming for impact. Teaching people the Word of God. We want the whole word to go to the whole world. This brings you closer to the life of the church. For those of you who want to go deeper, share both to your social media page as well as to your story. That gives your friend groups a chance to quickly view a clip from the weekly sermons and messages in a 24-hour cycle. Crossover. It's time to get the word out. Hey, Crossover family, this is Pastor Blake Wilson. I'm so excited about what we have going on this entire month. We're doing a series called The Bible, Live and in Living Color. Uh, tonight, we're going to kick off with Pastor Jerome Gay's Whitewashing of Christianity, an amazing new book. And I'm going to let him really get into it and explain everything to you. I'm not going to steal his thunder at all. But it's an amazing book by Pastor Jerome Gay. Great deal of scholarship, great deal of study, a history of African contributions to the Bible, and things that we just may have missed in all of our studies. And so he's going to reveal those things, unveil those things, so that we might really see all the historical contributions that the African race has made to the Christian faith. Also, next week, Brandon Washington, pastor of the Embassy Church in Denver, Colorado. He's also a contributor to the book, The Urban, Urban Apologetics. He will be doing the comprehensive gospel in the African-American church. The following week, Pastor Eric Mason, will be doing an overview of why urban apologetics is necessary in the African-American church. As a result, we're going to have a great month. I look forward to you tuning in tonight, the following week, February 16th, and then February the 23rd. Make sure that you share with your family and friends because this is going to be a week and a month that we see the Bible live and in living color. Thank you, Jesus. <sighs> He's worthy. Yes, and because he's worthy, I don't know about y'all, but I'm not ashamed. We are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is of God's power of salvation to everyone who believes. Hallelujah. Let's worship our Father together. We are not ashamed. We are not ashamed. Oh, the gospel of Jesus Christ For it is God's power of salvation And it is to that believes it and it is to everyone to everyone that receives it we shall Believe it. It is, it is, it is. 
God's word is light unto my path. His word. His word is light unto my feet. God's word. God's word is guaranteed to set you free. Set the captive free. Live eternally. Live eternally. doesn't mean it has to change. Jesus was a white man too. The biggest problem I got with Christianity, man, as long as you got black people worshiping a white Jesus, you will never ever truly rebel against your oppressors because when you see them, you see God. Crossover family, Pastor Jerome here. Uh, my wife and I, Krista Gay, bring you greetings here from Raleigh, North Carolina, and the entire 
Vision Church family. Listen, I love your pastor. I love Pastor Blake Wilson, his lovely wife, Ronique, and their two beautiful children. And I'm excited to be a part of this series you are doing for Black History Month, The Bible Live and in Living Color. And I'm grateful to talk to you about my latest book, The Whitewashing of Christianity. So we're going to dive right in. Let's pray and we'll dive right in. Father, we love you. We are grateful and thankful for this day, Father. I pray that as we look at scripture and history and sociology, that at the end of the day, we will see people come back to trust you, uh, for you are our Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Listen, I'm excited to talk to you about the whitewashing of Christianity, a hidden past, a hurtful present, and a hopeful future. The Lord gave me that title because I want to look at the, the hidden past of Africa and Africans' contributions to the, uh, the Christian faith. The hurtful present is how many of these uh, historical figures have been whitewashed and presented as white men and women. But then there's this hopeful future uh, that we have in Christ. And so I'm excited for us to dive in. February the 15th, 1974, Good Times aired an episode called Black Jesus. In this particular episode, J.J. painted a picture of Black Jesus. This is his brother, Michael. And uh, they, they wanted to depict this based on something they had read in the book of Isaiah. They did this before Mama Florida came home. Uh, Mama comes home and she is furious. She is infuriated. One of the things Michael said when he put the picture of black Jesus on the wall, he said a black family should have a picture of a black Jesus. Mom came home. She wasn't having it. And she said something very pivotal that you can see here when you see white Jesus on the wall and she's pointing to the white Jesus and she says, this is the only Jesus I know. Mike offers to let's leave both Jesuses up on the wall, white Jesus next to black Jesus. And she says, no, pointing to white Jesus. This is the only Jesus I know. And the one thing he don't need is a partner. Then she used this phrase. She said, now let's close the subject. And sadly, that's what American history has done for too long. They have closed the subject on Africa's contribution to the Christian faith. They have closed the subject on the black and brown presence in the Bible. They have closed the subject. And many people are wondering, in particular black and brown people, what place do we have in God's redemptive plan? And so evangelism and a heart for the lost is what led me uh, to write this book. Michael then takes his mom to the book of Isaiah where it talks about the, the, the hair like wool and skin like bronze. And again, this text actually has nothing to do with the skin color of Jesus, but rather uh, it's, uh, it's, it's an example of his judgment there. And so this leads us to where we're going to go for the rest of our time. So what is whitewashed Christianity? Whitewashed Christianity refers to the affinity of white Christian scholars to dominate the Bible, Christian art, literature, history with white people at the expense of authentic ethnicity and true scholarship in order to resonate most deeply with the white uh, with white audiences, primarily based on their experiences, presuppositions and world views. That's what whitewashing is, is when we take an entire faith and we whitewash it and we only highlight the contributions of Europeans. It's a it's Eurocentrism where we deify people of European descent and we ignore the contributions of Africans when they should be accentuated. Now, where do we start? We want to start with scripture, Genesis chapter one, verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, all the earth and creatures that crawl on the earth. Identity starts and ends with God. And so the way we like to say this is we've been created by God, created for God. We, all people are valuable to God, used by God, and God must be the defining factor of our lives. But when we study the landscape of American history, this reality was attempted to be blocked in the lives of black and brown people. That is the wicked history. And so when we talk about Imago Dei, that's Genesis chapter 126, this, this phrase, it's the image of God. But black and brown people, and many people using wrongly CRT, really they're guilty of Imago Sui, it's the image of self in the other, this is connected to what is known as social identity theory. This causes people to value people externally. 
And black and brown people have been historically, for centuries, especially here in America, devalued externally. But this is not God's fault. And this is why whitewashing must be exposed, because many people are making a decision to reject Christ based on misinformation presented by white supremacists who falsely called themselves Christians. That's why this is so important. This book and this effort is evangelistic in nature, and the body of Christ must be equipped on how to engage whitewashing but not move into hatred. Calvin Lockhart says this, one of the major psychological problems of the black man outside of the parent continent of Africa is that while he can always say, I have a country, he cannot really say, I have a home. And the way we've been treated here in America, it's been made clear that we have not been wanted and that this is not our home or we are not embraced. And so what we need to do is unpack this and then still find hope in Yeshua in the midst of all of this. And so I want us to think about race in a spectrum when we get to the racist, uh, the racist tactics of so-called Christians in antiquity. First, there's racial ignorance. This is not knowing. We can't jump to racism for everything. Then there is racial is uh, racial indifference. This is not caring. Racial insensitivity is caring less. And then racism. We're going to unpack how racism is connected. Racism is willful hatred. Uh, racism is the oppression of one group of people for the preservation of the perceived dominant group of people. To stay biblical, it is the sin of partiality, James chapter 2, verse 9, partiality or favoritism. You are showing favor to people of a particular hue, race, or color, and you are denying the dignity and the value of the other. That's what racism is. And so for the rest of our time, here's what I want to do. I want to look at three sectors that attack black and brown value, the political, the social, and the religious sector. So first, we're going to look uh, at Exodus, and I want us to see where we get this idea of oppression and prejudice of some form that we can look at Scripture and be able to trace it. Exodus chapter 1, verse 9 and 10, And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. So Pharaoh gives us an anatomy of oppression, okay? So he says there, referring to the Jews, are a threat numerically and structurally. They will overtake us, so we must oppress them. We Egyptians must see them as a threat socially and economically to justify our oppressive acts. They're not worthy to be treated as humans. They're a commodity. And the goal was control and domination. So Pharaoh... We see his sociology as well as his anthropology, and he gives us, now it's important to get this, uh, the anatomy of oppression, what we find in scripture, is given to us by an African man. And so this is not only a, uh, about race, this is clearly a spirit, uh, but, don't, but don't get it twisted. Many people try to say it's not a skin issue, it's a sin issue. I agree with that, but sin has names. We got uh, Ten Commandments speaking against sin in Exodus chapter 20, and racism is a sin against humanity. But Pharaoh gives us this anatomy of what oppression looks like. And now we're going to see how this played out in history. We're going to look at three cats, Tacitus, Blumenbach, and Adolf von Harnack, first of Germania. Now, he's a historian and the author of Germania. Now, he said this. He said, Germanic tribes are free, watch this, from the taint of intermarriage. Uh, he stressed the superiority of Anglo-Saxon religious and political institutions. Tacitus stressed the superiority of the superiority of their institutions. Watch this was in their blood. This is what Kelly Brown Douglas calls the Anglo-Saxon myth of superiority in her book, Stand Your Ground, Black Bodies and the Justice of God. And so, so Tacitus uh, also kind of connected to what's known as Romanitas, which is heavily uh, it, racially white, always wanted to put themselves above other people, right? Then there was something known as the teleological argument. And the teleological argument purported that the creator intentionally made people unequal. And so this argument basically says that God, God gave certain value and intelligence to particular races and he made them unequally. 
to whites he gave intelligence to enable them to direct wisely the activities of others. To non-whites he gave strong backs and fortified, uh, for strong backs fortified with weak minds and an obedient temperament so that they may uh, labor effectively under the supervision of white masters. The origin of this thinking can be traced back to Tacitus, who wrote this something similar in Germania. So when we talk, look at this uh, social sector, we begin to see how the sin in Genesis 3 plays out in Pharaoh's anatomy uh, of oppression in Exodus 1. And then we see that when he and Pharaoh enslaves million of uh, 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 Hebrew people. And we see this also play out in history. And just to be clear, this is all pseudoscience. This is foolish. But white people in antiquity uh, would, would rarely actually use a proper scientific hypothesis, hypothesis to come to their conclusion when it came to the dehumanization of black and brown people. Now, Blumenblatt, next, he was a German physician, naturalist, physiologist, and anthropologist. He is credited with coming up with racially based categories, Caucasian, white, uh, Mongolian yellow, Malayan brown, Ethiopian black, and American red. His studies are based on what is known as the degenerative hypothesis, which sought to advert a social decline by using pre-scientific method uh, to find the lowest contributors to society. And so I want to see all this pseudoscience. Now, again, mo a lot of this is before the scientific, me scientific method was invented. But what you see here is when it comes to black people, they can pretty much think, make up something and to try, try to apply in order to devalue us and our ancestors. Now we're fast forwarding. We go from class to race. The Middle Passage of 1619 was in Jamestown, Virginia. There were approximately 20 people on that ship. Fast forward between 1619 and 1660, uh, there wasn't a racially based uh, slavery system. It was more based on class. By 1660, indentured servitude was too expensive. So in the 1660s, uh, Virginia and Maryland passed laws making black servants for life. By 1710, the number of black colonies was 50,000. 1776, hmm, something, what, what happened in 1770? Oh, the Declaration of Independence, but not for us. By 1776, there were 500,000, from 50,000 to 500,000. By 1860, there were 4 million black people in America. This is three years before the Emancipation Proclamation. And the three primary sectors that uphold the, upheld slavery were the political, the economic, and moving here chattel slavery, right? And so the political sector, now we're moving here. Chattel slavery preceded American democracy. The structure and content of the original constitution was largely based on an effort to preserve slavery. So when we talk about the Confederacy and they wear these shirts talking, talking about heritage, not hatred. No, it's a heritage of hatred. When you read the Cornerstone speech, you see the dehumanization, the degradation, the devaluing of black and brown bodies. It's nothing to celebrate about that. And so oftentimes people put a blind eye to history because they don't like the ugliness of what their great, great, great grandparents did. Now, there's redemption for all, but you must repent and acknowledge sin to even get saved. But we want to turn a blind eye to the things that have happened. The southern slaveholding colonies formed a union on the condition that the federal government would not interfere with the right to own slaves. They'll try to say it's about states' rights. States' rights to do what? To own slaves people. Federalism was used to support the institution of slavery and political power of slaveholding states. This is why Thomas Jefferson could write, all men are created equal while owning slaves and not feel one ounce of hypocrisy because black and brown people were seen as beasts and not people. They were seen as property and not people. They were seen as a commodity and not people. They were not seen. We were not seen as people. And it's interesting that they were called the Africans barbaric, but they were the barbarians. No heart, no compassion. This is what sin will do to anyone. The Emancipation Proclamation of 1863 uh, is a lot of times presented to us uh, by crediting Abraham Lincoln with freeing the slaves. Uh, but, but rarely do we actually kind of look at the heart of Lincoln. And so here's a quote from uh, Abraham Lincoln. He says this, 
I will say then that I am not, not ever have been in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of black and of the black and white races. I am not nor ever have been in favor of making voters or jurors of Negroes nor qualifying them to hold office, not to intermarry with white people. And I will say, in addition to this, that there is a physical difference between the white and black races, which I believe will forbid the two races to get uh, from two races from living together on terms of social and political equality. And in as much as they can so cannot so live while they do remain together, there must be the position of superior and inferior and as and I, as much as any other man, am in favor of having the superior position assigned to the white race. President Emancipation Proclamation signing Abraham Lincoln. He did this for the union, not because he saw any value or what we would call the Imago Dei, the image of God in black and brown people. This is American history that they want to whitewash while whitewashing the Christian faith. This is what we must see and know, but this must not define us. But it's important that we understand and know this because the reason so many are coming against the education system on teaching what actually happened is because they want to look at history with rose colored glasses because they don't want to embrace the whitewashing and the, the truth of the barbarianism of history. Tom Skinner, Tom Skinner wrote this. He wrote a book, excellent book, called How Black is the Gospel? And he said this, the Emancipation Proclamation merely said the black man is not a slave. It never defined him as a man. You just gave freedom to people you have enslaved uh, for well over 100 years, and you don't set up anything for them. In fact, you then put in these barbaric laws, essentially outlawing, outlawing normal living to get them right back in to slavery. Michelle Alexander, the author of The New Jim Crow, she says, since the nation's founding, African-Americans repeatedly have been controlled through institutions such as slavery and Jim Crow, which appear to die, but are reborn in new form, tailored to the needs and the constraints of its time. Just, just so people can know, my white brothers and sisters need to hear this, black people don't consider Jim Crow freedom. It was not separate but equal. It was separate and unequal. It was separate and unjust. It was separate and unjust. It was not freedom. Just because we had the Emancipation Proclamation signed five decades before, Jim Crow, really a little bit more than that, Jim Crow was not freedom. It was just different forms of an unjust and unjust institution. Skinner says this, Virginia law stated that the conferring of baptism, because now we're going to get, we've done the social, we've done the political, now we're going to make our way to the church, to the religious. He said, Virginia law stated that conferring, uh, the conferring of baptism does not alter the condition of the person as to his bondage or freedom. I want you to see this, so-called Christians, and I do not believe that they were, because 1 John makes it clear, it says you cannot love God who you cannot see if you don't love your brother who you can see. And they refuse to love black and brown people. And so, so much so, they would say, hey, uh, even if they're Christians, they're not worthy of dignity. They're not worthy of equality. And that's what many of them said, and that's how many of them live. And so the church, uh, sadly, embraced tons of eisegetical, unbiblical, unloving philosophies. One of them is the curse of Ham. Because of uh, the curse of Ham myth, because that's what it was, is because Ham was the father of black people and because he and his descendants were cursed to be slaves because of uh, the sin against Noah, some Christians said that Africans and their descendants are destined to be servants and should accept their status as slaves in the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. This is what I call family, chronic eisegesis. The premise of the curse is black and brown people are cursed. Black and brown people are not human and don't have souls. And in some, not all, but some said that they were, uh, we were incapable of salvation. The chronic eisegesis. Eisegesis, when you add to the text, instead of exegesis you want to pull from, eisegesis when you want to add to, 
The Bible says, curse be Canaan. If you just read, that's all they had to do. All they had to do was turn the page and read. Curse be Canaan in Genesis 9, 25, which means only one of his four sons uh, were cursed. Not all four were cursed. Secondly, cursive do uh, have expiration dates. Exodus chapter 20, verse 5, typically three to four generations. Canaan's curse was fulfilled by the subjugation of Canaan by Israel, 1 Kings 9, 20 and 21. And then God's word says that disobedient based curses can be reversed when people repent. Exodus 20, verse 6. So when it came to us, people even weaponized scripture to hold on to their racist views. And this family is why we have the whitewashing of Christianity. Uh, in Christ and Culture, is a book written a few decades ago. One of the things they said just about uh, white Christians during that, and during that time is when they would be missionaries, they, they saw other tribes needing to be civilized before they could be evangelized. So this idea of uh, nationalism and ethnocentrism, which is really Eurocentrism, would eclipse the gospel because they would want them to assimilate into white European culture before they would even share the gospel with them in some cases. Ada von Harnack, I mentioned him earlier, <clears throat> German uh, theologian and historian. Something about Adolfs, something about those Adolfs. Adolfs caused a lot of trouble. Adolf von Harnack argued against the African influence on, on the Christian faith ignored African influence in favor of a Eurocentric version of history, and many scholars followed his lead. And this is, this is why we see in our uh, reform seminaries in many cases, I'm not going to paint all of them with one broad stroke, but many, uh, they, they only highlight pretty much history from the Reformation on as if church history started in Wittenberg. And a lot of the contributions of these African people who gave us concepts, and we'll talk about this very soon, of the Trinity and, and, and uh, meditative reflection, was, was invented by African Christians. A lot of this history is either ignored or these people are presented as white. How Africa Shaped the Christian Mind, excellent book by Thomas Oden. He said, major participants in Euro-American theology seem to have thus missed entirely the literary, the literary richness of the distinctive African Christian imprint on, watch this, the African imprint on Europe, not the other way around, and the formation of the Christian mind. These mistakes passed on through the graduate study programs that have formed scholars of all continents subliminally. And so you, you have even black people who just don't believe that, that we have contributed much and, and they only know about white scholars and white theologians and white church fathers and that's all they know. Now let, let's be clear, the issue is not the inclusion of white people, the issue is the exclusion of black and brown people and how God has used us in his plan of redemption. But now look at this, the whitewashing of Christianity. I don't know who this is. I affectionately call him Pantene Pro V Jesus. Look at that beard, uh, flowing hair, but historically inaccurate. It has been whitewashed. And so uh, people in that, obviously Jesus, this is one of the oldest pictures uh, of a brown-skinned Middle Eastern man, which is what Jesus was, a brown-skinned Middle Eastern man. History has in turn used this image. And it's important to understand that when you talk about the American Bible Tract Society in the 1800s, they would only use white imagery and history records. They say this, that they wanted to associate Christianity with whiteness. And while we have in iconography, you have all, you got Asian looking Jesus, you, you, you have people doing that. This image was forced on black people. The difference is this image was forced and we were told that he would save us. But of course he wouldn't. Because this image was an arm of white supremacy. What God did, God used, he incarnated himself in Christ to save all humanity, not just the white parts. Because based on Acts chapter 17, we all have a common ancestry anyway. Ephesians 2, he's torn down that dividing wall. But this image, or images similar to this, anything with brown skin was replaced historically with this one. When we talk about, you know, church fathers like Augustine, Augustine was an African man in place of this image. When we look at 
uh, the Black Dwarf, and some argue about that, that nickname, but Athanasius, who fought at the Council of Nicaea, instead were given this image. We're constantly given white images of black history. <laughs> white images of Christian history. And this affects, now here's, here's the thing. This affects the way to pe that people see the faith. Now, let me be clear. The answer to whitewashing isn't blackwashing. I've said this earlier. God has used all people, but the black and brown contribution is the one that has been intentionally ignored and whitewashed in our seminaries and history and books. So now we got to have a Sankofa moment in a sense that we need to reclaim, recover, go back and fix these things. Here we go. Uh, Whitewash Christianity. Here's a clip from the Breakfast Club uh, with Dr. Umar Johnson, who calls himself Papa, which stands for the Prince of Pan-Africanism. And here he is talking about the effect. He's not a Christian. And this video has millions upon millions of views and, 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 and likes. And it's important that we understand this, not as necessarily fans, but as missionaries. This is the message that is going out. Yeah, so we can just keep going. Are you going to cut that part up? Okay, guys, I'm going to send you this video so you can just let it play. So I'm pausing. I'm going to send you this, the raw file, so you can just let this play for crossover. All right, let's keep going. Three, two, one. So when you see that clip, family, you see the effects of the whitewashing of Christianity and how Dr. Umar... Uh, sees uh, white Jesus as a weapon of mass destruction against the black community. And he's right in a sense on that. But it's not the only weapon within our community, but it is one of the weapons. And so the whitewashing of Christianity, you whitewash history, you whitewash scholarship, and you see a whitewashing of culture. Now, uh, scripture is clear that God has created a people from all people, Ephesians chapter 2, Nimrod, Caleb, Jethro, David, Solomon, Zephaniah, the Ethiopian eunuch, and John Mark, who wrote the Gospel of Mark, was an African man. He's a people of African descent. John Mark, uh, there's something known as Markan priority, which is a theory that says Mark's Gospel was written first and the other Gospels are based off of his. Even if you're Matthean, meaning Matthews was first, uh, John Mark was an African man. He was a Cyrenian Jew. This is something that we can celebrate. A uh, Tertullian, African. Athanasius, African. Augustine, African. Of the five women mentioned in Matthew's genealogy, Matthew 1, 1 through 16, four of, uh, are of Hamitic descent, Tamar, Rahab, uh, Bathsheba, and Ruth. There is color in the earthly lineage of Jesus. We can celebrate that. The earliest parts of the New Testament we have is John Ryland's papyri, found where Egypt is dated 125 A.D. These are things that we often don't know about. And I want to uh, introduce you to some of these and some images that we had created because uh, trying to find black imagery of African people in Christian history is a task in of itself because when you look, you see that all of them, literally all of them, are, have been whitewashed and presented as white people. So we can celebrate Tertullian. And I want to shout out my wife. Uh, she has I Am Apparel, where you can get clothes to celebrate this rich Christian and black history and rock Christian history on clothes so we can replay and color correct and get a different narrative. Tertullian was a prolific writer and author from Carthage and another influ influential black African uh, to impact the Christian faith in the world for his death. He has also, he's done extensive research. He went against her heresy. He consistently engaged and confounded those that wanted to propagate a false gospel. But we don't have to stop there. There's origin of Alexandria. Uh, he was also known as um, Adamantius, uh, was one of the many early African Christian scholars to merge faith and reason. He was into apologetics, which we're told to do in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. But then, listen, we can't leave the sisters out. Um, these two women here, Perpetua and Felicity, um, were Christian martyrs of the third century. Perpetua was married, noble woman, uh, said to have been 22 years old at the time of her death for Yeshua. In fact, one of them uh, wrote in her diary that her, her dad tried to convince her to leave the Christian faith, but she refused and was willing to give her life for the sake of the faith. Listen, these two women give a new meaning to the phrase, black girls rock. 
And so many of us, we just don't know. And it's important that we recapture and we understand and we celebrate this history. They were put to death along with others in, Car in Carthage in Africa. Athanasius, a lot of people, if you've, if you've engaged some of these woke brothers, uh, unredeemed wokeness, they say, man, Christianity was invented at the Council of Nicaea. Wrong. In fact, one of the leading voices at the Council of Nicaea was this black voice, a man by the name of Athanasius. And Athanasius uh, presented an argument that Jesus was not a created being. That's why in the Nicene Creed it says, begotten and not made. And so he argued with another African by the name of Arius uh, that, that argued that Jesus was created. And he argued essentially for the deity of Christ and the essence of Jesus. So listen, Christianity was not created at Nicaea. Christianity was debated at Nicaea. It already existed. In fact, 12 years before the Council of Nicaea, Constantine issued the Edict of Milan legalizing Christianity. So how could he legalize something that hasn't been invented yet? So history records another black voice, African black voice, God used in his plan of redemption. Athanasius, someone we can celebrate. Shenouda of a treat. Again, another one that we often don't know, also known as Shenouda the Great. Uh, in fourth century, he was committed to orthodoxy, confronted heresy, the heresy of his day. A prolific writer led the white monastery, white because of the walls and the, uh, uh, the because of the walls of the monastery. The monks were primarily people with melanin, as Shenouda himself, and was he was fluent in Coptic and Greek. He's an example of the rich Christian history in Africa and how Africans influenced orthodoxy and. The Christian faith. Augustine of Hippo. Man, it's not enough superlatives to describe this man, right? Uh, writ, written, uh, writ, writ, has written extensively about uh, the Christian faith. And we have tons of books, and he has helped us think critically. His mother was named Monica, historically assumed to be a Berber, dark skinned African woman. And some have even heralded her as a black saint. Augustine was a master in rhetoric and able to use modern vernacular uh, with uh, what he said, what, what, what many in urban communities say today. Uh, Augustine had bars. <laughs> he, he gave some bars like unity in things necessary, liberty in things doubtful, charity in all things. That's a bar from him. With love for mankind and hatred for sin. This is where we get the phrase, love the sinner, hate the sin, from this man. Jesus Christ will be Lord of all. He will not be Lord at all. And many others. These are so many that we can celebrate. But there have been some responses to whitewashing. Three, liberation, self-hatred, and urban apologetics. Um, some of these, uh, Dr. Esau Esau McCauley talks about those that embrace self-hatred. He says, one sought to end racism and form family rooted in our mutual recognition of the Imago Dei and belief in the Lordship of Christ. Another group accepted the black plight and tried to make the most of it, looking for an eschatological redemption. A third saw hope in revolution. And in a sense, urban apologetics is a biblical gospel-centered revolution. We see self-hatred in men like uh, Muhammad uh, al Fasi, who embraced a whitewashed narrative and wrote extensively against black people, like he was Arab African, wrote against his own people. The issue with self-hatred is this, it's, it centralizes ethnocentrism, it rejects the Imago Dei, it embraces inferiority, and it deifies cultural assimilation. Ethnocentrism and self-hatred oppose how God has created people in his image. Brown Loritz addresses this in his book, Right Color, Wrong Culture, and he breaks down C1, C2, C3. Essentially, a C1 is someone who uh, integrates themselves into another culture. He uses the Hellenistic Jews, and a, a good example in uh, television history is Carlton Banks would be a C1. A C2, someone who is culturally flexible, Denzel Washington. And then C3, culturally inflexible, he uses uh, the Pharisees and Al Sharpton. The point he's making is there are different approaches. And so there's the liberation theology approach, James Cone historically, the self-hatred approach, and then there's the urban apologetic approach. The reason we must reject this, self-hatred, because self-hatred rejects the image of God in people. The primary mark of our identity is our creator, not our culture. And redeeming humanity. God has redeemed all culture. God intended for you to be the color you are. Not, listen, not as a defining marker, but as a mark of his creative genes. Listen to me. Don't make your color 
Remember, it is a feature of who you are, but not the foundation of who you are. Color and cultural affinity aren't inherently evil. Dr. Tony Evans says this, our founding fathers' failure to apply the principles of freedom that they were espousing to the area of race is a prominent reason why many minority individuals today are less than enthusiastic uh, to join in with those in our nation who want to exalt or restore America's history and heritage. But God's kingdom does. In his, one, his book, One Us Embrace, he points out, again, the rich African history, black and brown presence in Scripture. And so we must reject self-hatred. Um, Galatians 2.20 says this way, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I live in the flesh, I now live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's what we do. When we understand this, family, when we look at first, again, starting our identity with Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, not just our skin color, that's a feature, that's not the foundation. Christ is the foundation of our identity. But we begin to unpack some of the, the devilish things that happen in history, and we find our identity in Christ. He says, the difference is that I no longer go out, go out and fight for dignity for myself because I already have it as God's son. You already have it as God's daughters. Dr. Evans says this, when we fail to embrace a oneness perspective rooted in kingdom theology, though unless we, like Joshua, surrender to the truth that God's kingdom is not here to take sides, God's kingdom is not black, God's kingdom is not white, God's kingdom is not Hispanic, or it's not nor Asian, Middle Eastern, or Indian, God did not come to take sides. God came to take over until we bow beneath the overarching rule set forth by our ruler. That's the only way we're going to achieve unity. Listen, family. Reconciliation is impossible without confrontation, and whitewashing must be confronted so that we can move. So what do we do? We need to be aware. We need to be aware of the fact that whitewashing is affecting the way people see Christianity, and some people are making an eternal decision to reject Jesus. We need to acknowledge that whitewashing is a thing. Listen, family, if people say Christianity has been whitewashed, I agree with them. I want to acknowledge and give, uh, and give legitimacy to their concerns, but I must disagree with their conclusion if their conclusion is to reject Yeshua, to reject Christ. We want to attack. Listen, if you join us in exposing this, you'll be called a CRT, you're going to be called a social justice warrior, and people think just because they use pejorative terms that it moves the veracity of our argument. Don't worry about them. Stay on mission. Or to use Nehemiah's words, stay on the wall. And do what God has called you to do. But you'll be attacked. Let's abolish system of injustice and whitewashing that perpetuates a false narrative. We must agree to stand together and not go back. We must abandon the mindsets that got us here. And we must take action. We must create content. Family, I want to challenge you. We need more people creating solid, biblical, biblically rooted, gospel-centered content that addresses this. But it does not deify race. It makes Jesus the answer because he is the answer. But we got to take action, y'all, because God creates a people from all people. I want to end with this beautiful story. Josiah Henson escaped slavery and traveled abroad. And so he earned his own freedom. He visited the old plantation where his owner died. His former slave's owner's wife, his name was Josiah. She called him Sai. She said, Sai, your master is dead. Josiah back now as a free man back to the place where he was once owned, most likely abused, degraded, treated as property and not a person. She says, Sai, your master is dead. I love this. Josiah responded back and said, no, madam, my master is yet alive. Listen, black people understood the differences. Our ancestors understood the difference between white supremacy and the true God of the Bible. They knew the difference between what God said and what they made up. Listen, they did not try to beat Christianity in us. They attempted to beat inferiority into us and they were unsuccessful because our master is yet alive. And that's who we live for. And that's the message we must share, the true story of the gospel. But listen, as we're engaging people, people have more access to information than they ever have family. You can't just know your personal experience. You need to know the Bible. You need to know some history. And you need to know how to engage people that disagree with you. But you have the confidence of knowing that our master is still 
alive. I'll give you some resources. Woke Church by Dr. Eric Mason, Inside or Outsider by Brian Loritz. Stand from the beginning, he's not a Christian, but this is a great historical book on the history of racism, how Africa shaped the Christian mind, Thomas Oden, The Color of Compromise, Jamar Tisby, Reading While Black, Dr. Esau McCauley, Oneness Embrace, Tony Evans, Divided by Faith, Michael Emerson, Plantation Jesus by Scott Welch, Christian Slavery by Catherine uh, Bergner, uh, I'm sorry, Gerbner. Um, the Gospel of Racial Reconciliation, Russell Moore, Gospel Hamer Note, Dr. Vince Bantu, and obviously, yours truly, the White Washington Christianity. It's wherever it's available, wherever books are sold, and you can get it from my website if you want a signed copy, JeromeGayJr.com. So here's how you can follow it with me. My website, Instagram at Jerome Gay, website JeromeGayJr.com, Instagram at Jerome Gay, Twitter at Jerome Gay, TikTok at Jerome Gay 2, Facebook Pastor Jerome Gay, and Cash App if the Lord should lead you. Uh, but listen, family, um, uh, as we pray through this, guys, I'm also looking forward to joining you guys in March as you celebrate 16 years as a church. And so as I said, I love Pastor Blake Wilson. I love the whole team and staff and all the people crossover Bible Fellowship. Thank you for allowing me to be a part of this, the Bible live and in living color. I'm looking forward to talking after this as me and your pastor chop it up on some of these things we covered. I love you. God bless you.